Hello everyone. In this talk, I will continue discussing positivist approaches to knowledge and focus on experimentation. Experimentation, as I'm sure most of you know, is a widely used method in the sciences, uh, but also in the social sciences. It's far and away the dominant means of doing psychological research. Uh, it's more recently come into economics where behavioral economics has received a lot of attention. It's based on the premise that experimentation allows economists to understand how people actually make decisions and how they evaluate the choices open to them as opposed to inferring this on the basis of some rational model. In international relations, uh, it's very much a latecomer. A 2011 study by Rose McDermott indicated that only 4% of international relations researchers made use of experiments. Uh, a decade later, I expect that figure has still hasn't doubled. But nevertheless, experimentation is becoming more important in the field and getting more attention in top journals. Now, experimentation is the uh, quintessential positivist method. It uh, gathers data and uses statistical means to assess that data and to make inferences on the basis of it. Those who use experiments are concerned with internal and external validity. Internal validity means the degree of confidence we can have that the causes we identify or the results we find are statistically meaningful, that they don't include uh, errors and bias. Toward this end, uh, statisticians have developed a whole range of tests uh, that are used uh, to assess internal validity and Scholars still have some choices in this regard. Uh, what data do you throw out of the study that may be corrupted? Uh, where do you cut off tails at the end of the curve? And there has been some abuse of this, but the psychology profession has been remarkably good at policing itself and insisting on thorough independent uh, estimates of internal validity before journals will publish articles. I think we can have a reasonable degree of confidence uh, in not only the statistical procedures but the uh, honesty and um, skill uh, with which psychologists and reviewers of journals have attempted to use them to assess the internal validity of manuscripts uh, they read. Um, external validity refers to the extent to which we can generalize on the basis of findings. In the narrowest sense of the term, uh, it means do the results from our data set apply to other data sets, including those that we have not yet constructed. Uh, the assumption here is that the conditions that underlay uh, the data set that we derived our findings from will be the same in the data set to which we might apply it in the future or somehow can be controlled for. Uh, this is of course a big if and a big if that um, psychologists uh, recognize. Uh, let me just give you one example of this in international relations. Um, I published a book on the causes of war. Uh, 
and they had the subtitle, The Past and Future of War. And the past of war was based on a data set that I put together of all wars from 1648 until the present that involved either a great or a rising power on each side. I had 96 wars. I put together this kind of data set because I was interested in testing a range of realist and rationalist uh, theories about war and they for the most part apply to wars among uh, or involving uh, great powers. And what I discovered when I broke down my data set by the century and tracked that with the causes of war that I had identified, that there was a significant shift. And there were reasons for this, and I'll come back to this in, in another talk, but here the point I want to make is that the context in which wars were fought had changed considerably. That the findings in my data set for one century were not so good in explaining war in subsequent centuries, and the data set as a whole would be of no utility in trying to make statistical predictions about future wars. Now, this didn't mean that the data set was value, valueless. There were things that were learned uh, that told us important things about the kinds of wars that occur and why they did. But this I'll come back to. The broader point here is that external validity is a very serious issue in the first place due to the changing context in which whatever events we're studying take place. Uh, with experimentation in international relations, you'll see, uh, there's a second problem involved in external validity, and it has to do with the nature of the sample, which so often consists of students or random samples of population uh, constructed online. And can we generalize from what students or a cross-section of the population might think or do to what policymakers might do in a situation threatening war and peace? Now, where experimentation has made its biggest impact in our field, has to do with foreign policy. And it has to do with foreign policy because a key component of foreign policy is public support, especially in democracies. Leaders have to build support, preferably before they act, uh, but certainly after they have, uh, to maintain whatever policy they're pursuing. There are all kinds of uh, theories about the conditions under which this is possible, uh, ranging from uh, rally around the flag, which argues that almost generally policymakers can gain the support of the public when they couch an issue in terms of security. Securitization theory has developed in great detail to look at how this works, why it works, and where it doesn't work. There are also constraints, for example, on the kinds of weapons uh, policymakers can use, and there's also concern for collateral damage. Uh, experiments here can define the limits and conditions of public support and can be used to evaluate uh, the theories that uh, lay out uh, conditions or terms under which this occurs. And I'll just mention two examples, one, uh, both of them actually conducted by my colleague Ben Valentino at Dartmouth together with Scott Sagan uh, at Stanford. Uh, in the first of these, they were concerned 
or wanted to know how the public would tolerate the deaths of non-combatants, non-American non-combatants, if and when the United States used force abroad. So they constructed an imaginary scenario involving a uh, American war with Iran and situations in which the American use of force would result in increasing numbers of civilian casualties. Uh, what they found, to their surprise, was that the American population was uh, willing to uh, approve large numbers of non-combatant civilian casualties, collateral damage as it's technically known, provided they thought that this would save American lives and or advance the strategic objective uh, being pursued by uh, the government. In a second study, uh, they looked at the so-called nuclear taboo. Many of you know that the last and only times that atomic weapons <coughs> were used in combat was against Japan in 1945 uh, to bring about an end to World War II in the Pacific. Since that time, international relations uh, theorists, uh, some of them have argued that a taboo against using nuclear weapons has developed. There is seemingly uh, public opinion uh, support for this. Polls over the decades show decreasing support by Americans for Harry Truman's use of nuclear weapons at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In another game with an imaginary war scenario, Valentino and Sagan found uh, that this opposition was not nearly as strong as it was uh, thought to be. That Americans, uh, and they had a sample uh, constructed online, a random sample of the American population, adult population, were willing uh, to accept the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of dead in pursuit of victory or strategic objectives. So this gives uh, food for thought for the theories and as the public is the group involved in supporting or not supporting policy makers who use force, it's the relevant audience for both studies and policy. Now when we come to international relations theory, uh, things become more problematic, especially when we look at theories that are at the uh, systemic level that invoke so-called structural factors, like the balance of power, the polarity of the system, expectations of change in the balance of power. And here, studies that use students or a cross-section of the population uh, may have questionable external validity because such people have less knowledge and experience than policy makers and perhaps most importantly they're only playing a game and they know they're playing a game and they'll walk away from the scenario or experiment and go about their lives as if nothing had happened. By contrast, policymakers who are about to authorize the deaths of people, and maybe hundreds of thousands, depending on the scenario, are emotionally aroused. This has powerful consequences for them personally, for their well-being, psychological well-being, for their careers, for the future of their country. It's a very different context with decisions made by a very different group of people. Uh, this is 
a serious problem and all the more so in the kinds of games where um, individuals are expected to play states uh, as if they were unitary actors. Uh, now, uh, experiments can nevertheless still make an important contribution to international relations theory uh, by <coughs> looking at issues where the question of external validity uh, is not so problematic. So there are general theories about the conditions of cooperation and risk-taking and presumably here uh, using students or the general population can tell us something about these theories and it won't tell us anything directly about policy makers but it will tell us something that then becomes a starting point for studying policy makers by different means <coughs> excuse me uh, one of the most famous examples of this is Robert Axelrod's uh, book about uh, cooperation, the evolution of cooperation, based on a computer game called Tit for Tat. So a tit is a uh, cooperation, tat is defection, and the game is very simple. If the other side, you, it's a game of moves. If the other side cooperates, you cooperate. If the other side defects, you defect. And over time, it becomes rational for the other side to begin cooperating, and then you cooperate in response. And this may lead to a more cooperative situation, even if both sides started in a uh, hostile one where they didn't trust the other side. It got a lot of attention. It came out when Ronald Reagan was president and people were uh, desperate to find uh, ways uh, to get out of uh, developing or increasing hostility between the Soviet Union and the United States and moving toward a more cooperative environment. Uh, the game is useful because it illustrates the problems of applying a strategy like this the minute you move from a laboratory to something else. So uh, I used the game, or a variant of it, with American military officers, colonels, Navy captains, and their civilian counterparts from the CIA, Treasury, State Department. So men and women in their early to middle 40s, uh, quite experienced and at the War College because they were being tapped for higher policy assignments. One of the things that immediately became uh, obvious when you didn't define it as a tit-for-tat by assigning one a zero and a one, by ma but by making it real actions in the world, is that people had difficulty in distinguishing tits from tats. And we have examples of this among states where a cooperative measure is read as one that's hostile and represents defection. And defection is sometimes missed, or the very fact of sending a signal is dismissed as noise by the other side. So the game offers an abstract model, which when then applied to the actual world, tells us some of the differences and why it doesn't work as it's expected to. But this is an important step in gaining new knowledge about the psychology of cooperation and defection. And the same holds true for psychological models of decision making, which are uh, increasingly uh, important. Many of them rely on the findings of the cognitive revolution uh, that focus on the biases and heuristics that people use to make decisions. So these are shorthands which have provided some uh, evolutionary benefit over time that obviate the need for extensive search or reflection and allow quick responses to new challenges.
At the same time, they deviate significantly from rational behavior. And there are a host of studies along this line, most notably based on Tversky and Kahneman's prospect theory. Uh, prospect theory stipulates that people are more willing to take risks to avoid loss than they are to make gains. However, what constitutes a loss or a gain is subjectively defined by the participant. Well, there's a large literature uh, examining how this works and now a growing literature that attempts to apply it to international relations. And the same is true with motivational models of decision-making that start with the assumption that it's a hot emotional process, not a cold cognitive one, that people do whatever they can to reduce anxiety, uh, both because it's unpleasant to be anxious, but also because by reducing it, it allows them to move more confidently toward making a decision that involves risk. And here too, the work of Janice and Mann has been of central importance. It allows experiments with people and sometimes with uh, members of the policy-making community, journalists, military offices, uh, and the like, that gives us insight into policy-making, which can then be used in case studies of actual decision-making to see its relevance. Uh, in conclusion, I want to say that there's a, a certain irony here that um, experimentation, because it builds on large numbers of participants to get large enough samples to make uh, meaningful, uh, have meaningful findings, uh, is best used to uh, study and develop bottom-up theory, which of course is interpretivist in nature and most difficult to use and test, top-down theory, which tends to be positivist. Thank you very much.